be there. OK, welcome all. Um, for those of you who come for music, sorry, that'll happen, ha happen later. Apologize for that. Uh, I'm Henry Nash. I'm Adam Young. We're both cores on the Keystone project, the identity uh, service in OpenStack. And a lot has changed um, going uh, over the last few releases about roles and uh, how you assign them, how you consume them, how you pass your tokens around, and so forth. So we want to give you an update on that from Ataka to find some of the problems, uh, as well as some of the solutions. We're not all the way in Mataka. I'm not sure a lot of it will be all the way there. But there's a lot of good stuff in Mataka that you might want to be uh, aware of. And I would like to point out that this presentation is 100% unprepared, 100% um, unrehearsed, and we're making this up as we go along. Um, I would like to also make explicit what I tell anybody when they ask me for advice online, um, which is that I lie. I make things up, so take what I do and verify. And that's my way of actually getting bug reports in. Uh, I should say our way. Um, Henry is more reliable than I am, but <laughs> assume that he's lying too and verify everything that we're saying here. OK. Um, so the clouds are evolving. Um, and the, tenet, the, the kind of key of a lot of this stuff is the fact that when OpenStack first was designed, it was really trying to do AWS, but in a kind of open source way and, and be more flexible. Um, and the model we had for how you encapsulate your resources and the permissions you put on that encapsulation and how you get authenticated for those um, resources reflected that. But that isn't what we want for public cloud. It isn't what we want for complex private enterprises. We need something much more scalable. And some of the things here have been added recently. Uh, well, probably over the, Grizzly was really the start of this stuff. And then every release, we've had things that have kind of taken us further down that path um, that mean it much more appropriate for an enterprise model for authentication, author authorization, and access control. Damn it, I'm getting this clicker here. You got the clicker, OK. So, so this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, I, I'm going to give, kind of give you the intro stuff. Um, Adam's, um, one of Adam's great contributions to, to the project has been he's been one of the people who's been niggling and thinking as to saying, you know, think about these problems that enterprises are going to have. Think about how they're going to do the security. Think, you know, he's been great at bringing those things from, the, from, from Red Hat customers into the OpenStack community. So, when we get to the what's wrong bit, this man can wax lyrical. I'm going to let him. <laughs> I thought you were going to say that I was what was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just a quick recap. I don't quite know um, where the audience is in the room on this. Got three sl just three slides on. Just going to bring you up to you know the, the concepts the, the, of the way this works in OpenStack. Role-based access control. I suspect most people are familiar with that. Um, in an OpenStack world, it has a slight nuance in the fact that you, know, you always um, assign a role for a user on a target. There's no, you can't say, Henry has the role T-boy, full stop. You can't say that in OpenStack. I can say I've got, I'm role T-boy on project afternoon or something like that. Um, but I can't just say, Henry has the role T-boy. You can't say that. Um, and resources, of course, are owned by the products um, so that's how you assign roles to resources. You assign them to the project that encapsulates those resources, or to the domain that encapsulates those projects. And that's kind of really the concept you have. Um, and once you've done that, you want to use that to actually go and access those resources. And so in order to prove that you have permission, what you've got to do is get a token from Keystone, which means authenticating. Username and password is how it started. These days, federation is probably a, you know, is an up and coming way in terms of OpenStack. It's been around the community for a long time, SAML and OpenID open and, uh, and, and so forth. But that's really now fully supported in Keystone, so you can use federation. But however you authenticate, you get back a token, an OpenStack formatted token, not a SAML or anything else. And that's the thing you need to hand into every API request you make to whatever service you're talking OpenStack. It's the only way you get to execute OpenStack APIs. Uh, and that token is going to include, you know, for which container, i.e. project, typically, the container resources, did I actually authenticate to? 
um, did I authenticate and did I say I want roles for this particular container? What roles are they? Who am I? And, and for some cases, how authenticated, sometimes you need to know, well, it's useful to know how you authenticated. Uh, and optionally, a catalog, that's kind of um, by the by as far as this discussion is concerned. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Um, and once you've got that token, then obviously you're going to hand it off to an API call and hopefully magic will happen. Well, so, so how is it that, that that service, Nova, Glance, whatever it happens to be, how, what does it actually do? How does it actually take those roles and say, okay, yeah, well, I agree, you can, you can execute that API, API or, or you can't. And, and this is what it does. So actually the other, the other piece that's really not part of Keystone per se, it's not today, is that each of those services have a policy file that basically says, for these, not quite written this way, but essentially says, for these API calls that happen to be part of my service, Nova, whatever it happens to be, these are the roles you have to have, or this is the role or roles you must have to execute that API. And that policy file is controlled by the service. It's distributed by the service onto their nodes, actually outside of Keystone's control. So it's like a, it's part of the distribution of the logic out to the service points rather than have it all inside a single service and hence not very scalable. And so that's fundamentally how the, uh, the process of getting your, um, your, your permission out and, and, and validated by, by a service. Um, we're going to introduce polyfiles a little bit. If any of you have tried to modify the policy file, has it, hands up who has tried to mod modify a policy file in Keystone, or, or in any service for that matter? You have my deepest heartfelt sympathy. <laughs> Um, and so policy files, you know, they're not the most human readable, although in theory they're meant to be, um, format, but they basically give you, you know, this is a very simple example here of, you know, how you define some rules, um, in this case saying, what is the rule for compute delete in Nova? Um, and, and you can have, you know, rules within there to give you some logic and so forth. And each of the service have these. Um, you know, Keystone ones um, is a, you know, you know, this is an example of the, the default one that was Keystone, um, where, you know, you, 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 know, you can decide, you know, in, in Keystone v2, basically, you know, admin meant you could really do anything. Adam, why don't you talk a bit about admin and policy files? There's a few examples on here for policy files. Why don't you talk us through some of those, and that'll go in, then we'll get into the bit about so, what's wrong. So. You, you want me to talk about admin without talking about what's wrong with admin? I, we'll introduce the policy files, and it'll lead right into the, the problem. Um, God, I want to talk about what's wrong. Um, okay, so the um, admin role, if we, if, we, if, we, if we can dig back through the, the, uh, the mists of time to when Keystone was an internal project at Rackspace and not even part of, not even incubated, um, roles were global. And you see a lot of vestiges of this in the approach towards um, thing to the policy files and, and the enforcement, as as Henry alluded to before or said before. Um, if you're admin, um, and that's a global um, role, then what does it mean to scope it in to a given project? How can I talk about this without talking about what's wrong, Henry? I, I, okay, here's what's wrong with it. I'm going to jump to it. Okay, the problem is. Um, and if you want to look it up in Launchpad, it is bug 968696. The one that says adminness is improperly scoped, or if you're admin somewhere, you're admin everywhere. And this is okay when you're all one organization and admin is one person and you're supporting a small number of people, but this doesn't scale. If the problem is that, you know, um, how do you deploy a 10,000 node data center and, you know, with a million virtual machines on there and, and all the different pieces there, you have to be able to do things more, more granular. And so you don't want to give away the keys to the kingdom to, to every last person who has to be able to go in there and still solve problems for the people that are making use of the, the, the cloud deployment. The idea that you know, it's, it's all admin means that it all gets through one bottleneck, you know, and that bottleneck can be pretty tight. So, what we've tried to do is uh, identify, first of all, looking at the policy files, how, how these things work. And if you look at the, uh, the examples 
because you know, as Keystone guys, we tend to get myopic and look at the Keystone policy file. But really, what we, do we care about? It's OpenStack. We care about Nova as our primary consumer, because if, if we can't get what we want to do through Nova, it, nobody else is going to adopt it. And then um, Neutron just takes it and they, they, you know, in Spinal Tap terms, turned it up to 11. Um, so here are uh, a fragment out of each of those files. The top um, and the Nova one, you see context is admin, admin or owner, default. Those are rules that you'll see at the top of the file that are designed to be reused. And the default is what happens if you don't have anything specified. You can see most of these things say that admin or owner. So is admin means the admin role, these things filter on down, and that the project, or that the project matches. It's not even really doing a role check. Um, and then the last two bullet points on the Nova one are examples of how these applied, either a straight is admin true or admin or owner. Um, Neutron, you can see they're doing something similar, um, but their concept and their use of the term owner is a little bit different. It's that the tenant ID matches because they're still talking about tenants, which is the, probably the single most confusing thing in OpenStack. And I'm going to apply you know, the first rule of troubleshooting. It's all Adam's fault. We, um, we had this division in, in the terms we use. And we inherited this. This came back to the day where Rackspace and, and NASA had different views. So sometimes you saw tenants, sometimes you saw projects. And we wanted to get to choose one, so we chose project. And everybody still calls them tenants. So. <laughs> Um, admin or owner, you see it's similar, it's really close, but then they have this stuff down here like role AD VSVC, I think that's the advertising service or something like that. Um, but they have this idea of starting to, to actually put in, uh, roll R back into place. Um, oh. Now I'm going to hand this over to Henry because the V3 cloud sample was Henry's, uh, I won't call you magnum opus, but it certainly <laughs> was a, a slow work to get Keystone's policy file under control, and one of the problems that we have is because people are deploying the existing policy files, we can't just change them without breaking everybody who's expecting the existing rules. So V3 Cloud Sample, while we've been telling people for a long time this is the way we want to go, we can't make it the default. Thanks. Um, I'll hold on to this. Yeah, you okay. um, so as Adam said, the first thing we did when we said, OK, well, okay, clearly admin everywhere is not right. So, so, so of all the services which needs, definitely need something more, it's Keystone. If you're in a public cloud, you want to have cloud admin, domain admin, project admin, and probably a few others you know, that, that, that may be suitable to your own particular setup. How is it you're going to provide that kind of level of differentiation? So shipping the, ships with, with OpenStack, with Keystone, as well as the standard policy.json file, is this other file called v 3 cloudsampleJSON which is meant to be an example of this. Here's how you would stratify your administration such that you can have cloud admins, which look after, you know, obviously the whole cloud. For each of the, say, companies that typically a domain is used to capitalize a company or a division in a company that wants to look, wants to look after their own users and groups and projects so that you can then delegate the responsibility to looking after those users and groups and projects to ad admins of that domain, but they can only do that domain. And then within that domain, they may want to create project admins that can only look after that project or a set of projects. So, you know, you know, this is a fairly complex subject, and we're happy to go through this stuff, you know, offline. But if you look at this, for example, um, you know, you can see at the bottom here when, in where it says, you know, what project can I list? Well, you know, so if I'm the owner, that's okay of the project. But, you know, we all started to say, well, you know, the rule is you're admin and you're the matching domain ID. And basically what this text said is, well, yeah, you can do it if you're admin, but only if you're admin in the domain of which the project is in. So we start including the logic to say, okay, well, you can't list all the projects if you're admin. You can only list the ones that match the domain ID. Um, so what we're doing is matching is, we got a, you got a token, perhaps with a domain, a domain scope token, and then we're saying, is the project you're looking at in that domain? And so, so the, the checks for admin matching domain ID says you get admin required, and that kind of you know, weirdo logic there basically says, and the domain ID is the th you know, matches the one that has been passed in. So if you look at the VC cloud sample, it'll give you a, a, a starting point for how you might stratify your administration, sitting from a Keystone perspective, because well, Keystone supports our back like everything else, um, to, to stratify those kinds of roles. Um, the one thing we've, one new thing we've done in Mataka is, 
is improved, and, and we talk about later in the presentation. If you see the second line here, if you think about, if, I, if I'm a cloud admin, the thing I definitely don't want is someone who's like a domain admin or a project admin to somehow make themselves cloud admin. Otherwise, that kind of defeats the logic of this. So in this we'll get there, Henry. We'll get early there. example, <laughs> we had to um, basically, you would actually, when you took this sample, you'd paste in the domain ID of the admin of an admin domain. And that would say, you're, if I you're do an that. admin of that, then only you, yeah. can, um, y y only you can be cloud admin, and nobody else can add roles to that domain either. But that Doesn't makes work. a problem is that you, you, know, you somehow have to paste the bloody ID in each uh, of every time you stand up a cloud, not very scalable. So in Mataka, we address that as well, and we'll talk about, about that later on. Right I'm going backwards, aren't I? Okay. But, but one. Enter Mataka. So, enter Mataka. These are the things we've done in the Metaka release that ease some of these problems. Um, and um, as I said, we're not all the way there by any means, but we're taking an incremental approach to knocking down the barriers that help us have proper admin delegation and proper support for you know, um, admin and, and um, preferential capabilities across OpenStack. Um, so Adam, do you want to talk about implied roles? That was your baby. Okay, let's see. Okay, I talked a little bit about bug nine six eight six nine six, um, and uh, that was the first thing that we had to knock out because this is really um, tying us to a, a simple, simple place. Um, but beyond that, we want more fine grained roles. We want to be able to say, well, the. the, the yucky. Um, we want to be able to say that somebody can be an auditor or an observer. They can only read, and that, that's probably the single largest request we've had for, for um, changes in the role stuff. Um, but a lot of people, uh, anybody from DreamHost here? Anybody work with DreamHost? Uh, so I, in addition to being you know, an engineer here, I have, I've been a customer of DreamHost for a long time, and I've noticed one thing on their cloud that they did was they said, we're just going to set up the networking for you. Um, you, you, know, you, you, you sign up with us, we'll create a project for you, we'll, we'll build the network for you, and then we're not gonna let you touch that. Now, maybe there's some higher level of service that you can do that, but they don't let me touch it. They, they know better, I break things. Um, so I think this is a pretty common pattern where you say there's something that is kind of an end user operation, but you know, there's certain people we want to let them crawl before they, they trip and die, um, and so these people, we wanna remove some subset of that. But, we still need to be able to give it back and give it to somebody else. So this idea of um, storage or, or um, uh, networking, causing trouble tickets, um, we want to be able to choose who gets this additional ability. Um, so rebooting a VM, uh, you, know, it might, you might have some sort of uh, monitoring system that has to reboot a VM, but it shouldn't be creating a new one. Um, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that it should uh, be able to create a new one. So we want to have a role that would, you could say, this has only the amount of permissions to reboot a VM. As a public cloud, um, it, this is all about delegation. Not just delegation, but the ability to delegate delegation. How to tell somebody that they have the power to do their job without giving them the, the power to do more than their job. And as we start talking at scale, this is going to become the, you know, the major, major pain point. Um, how can the enterprise map roles that are meaningful to them onto whatever the provider has created? Because they're not necessarily managed by the same people. Okay, so. And, and just to pick up one point to introduce that, what, part of the vision is that we're seeing here is that today, there aren't, typically most clouds have, have few roles, partly, be, you know. Because you know, we don't ship them. Yeah. We don't ship them. If you th play forward your mind to, to when cloud providers, you know, as the, as the public cloud providers particularly, and, and private ones as well, um, if they want to attract the maximum number of customers on a given cloud, they're going to want to create, you know, a, you know, probably the most fine set of roles they can, such that they can give everyone the freedom they want. But it doesn't mean everyone wants the same freedom. So how is it that they can have many roles, but then not make it just super complicated for everyone? That's the dichotomy. As we think we'll go to many more fine-grained roles in your cloud, we need ways of packaging them up sort of thing or aliasing them so you can actually give them out in reasonable chunks to particular customers or to particular sub-customers without complicating it for everyone. Okay, so I think I went the wrong way before. This I think is the next one that we're supposed to be talking about. Um, so to get 
to the internals of how things happen in Keystone. Often I'll have an idea and I'll put it out there and some people tell me I'm crazy. Well, everybody will tell me I'm crazy, but I'm crazy about this specific idea. And every now and then I'll take something and Henry will take that to the next level. And that's what happened here. So this was my first idea and this went through a few iterations just here. Um, if we make it so that you can have role chaining where if I assign admin to you, you're automatically a member. Now I don't need to go through and create a specific assignment for all my admins to be member in order to enforce policy on somebody that they have to have the member role. If they're an admin, they're automatically a member. And if I want to take something like member, this big one, and break it down to two parts. Say I want to take the network stuff and break it off. So I create a network member role, but I don't want to break everybody already. I could say that member implies network member. And then if I want to take that away in the future, I can have, you know, power member and, 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 and newbie member, and only the power member will get everything. But to start off with, I need a way to move forward. And that's where this whole thing started from. How can I take what I have now, make it so we can change things, and yet not break everybody? So prior and implied. Um, the prior role, and, and, it's, and the reason why it's not called existing or explicit is because this is chaining. So A can imply B, B can imply C, and by getting A, I get all the way through to C. So if, if admin implies member and member implies observer, if I assign admin, I get observer. It always has to start with an explicit assignment. Keystone is going to look for what you have explicitly assigned when you uh, do something with the token API, and then expand out all these implicit in a chained manner. Um, they can be defined via the web API or Python only for now. We didn't get this all the way through to the CLI, but this does work, this can be used now. So this right here is the first, and I think the most powerful tool for getting us to be able to move forward. I'm gonna figure this out by the thing. So here's an example of creating it using the, the Python API. Um, if you um, have the member role created, the reader role created, and we list, you can see what you have there. When, you know, I guess I cut out some of the, the really cool stuff, which is actually setting up the implication thing. Did I have that, have that in there? Oh, create implied. Yeah, there it is, that last line there. Um, so that's the API that you do. This says member as the prior role implies the reader role. And then when I go and request a token for somebody who already has um, member assigned in the token response, I don't know why I'm pointing at this. I don't know where the actual clicker is. Um, you can see that both roles will be expanded out there just as they would be if they were explicitly assigned. Um, Yeah, this is the same thing in, 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 in more detail, but this is what people are looking for. Admin implies member, member implies reader, admin can apply read admin, audit, reader. You can have it as a, it's, it's what's called a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. So you might have two different ways that you get to the same implied role. And if you assign both trees, you don't have to worry about cycles and all that kind of stuff. It will resolve, it resolves to a set. So the rules are designed to say, don't follow the same path a couple times when you blow it on out, but you can, um, come up with these kind of things that have multiple ways of ending up getting these really fine-grained roles. Um, so if you wanted to change owner to member in the policy files, then you can do role colon member. That's, I think, clear. You're saying if you are a member, you can do this, um, and you don't have to have admin or owner roles because admin implies member here, and it'll keep the policy files smaller. Now, you're, 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 we're starting to build tighter coupling between the custom roles and the custom policy files. So there is a, uh, a little bit of overhead that we are putting on your shoulders, which we're trying to make this stuff better in future releases, but we didn't even have the tool before. This is the first step there. And, and one of the points about that is that, um, you know, you could do this today by just modifying your policy files and making them very, very complex. I think that's a bad idea, partly because the more complex a policy file is, you know, just the, the, a the harder to understand, the harder it is to convince yourself that you're not creating loopholes and uh, and, and abilities for people to exit APIs you don't want to. And so, by separating this to say, let, let, let's make the policy files as simple as we can, and then put the, if you like, the, the chaining of those roles, you know, basically into into the database and accessible by the API, then you can actually set that up, modify it, convince, you know, and, and analyze it more closely and tune it to what you want without having to go change policy files, which are distributed out to all the nodes. So you need to make sure all the nodes get updated with your changes. So that was one of the, the reasons to go this direction rather than just let you kind of build an ever more increasingly 
complex policy file. How many people are local to Austin here? Anybody? Okay. So I was thrilled when I found out that we were um, having this, that there's actually a shopping mall here called The Domain. And so that's a picture of what we have here for, for Henry's domain specific roles. I wonder roles. where you got that from. So yeah, I, I, it, this is actually here in Austin. Um, so this is the case where Henry came up with the idea of domain specific roles, I think f first or in parallel to becoming with applied roles. And it was one of these when we started talking, we realized that they were complementary. So we in, in, implemented implied roles and then we got to this. Um, and so, th so this is taking it a stage further. Think back to when I said earlier, imagine when you have clouds with many fine grain roles, potentially, you know, with chained as well with implied roles. A given customer comes along and you host them on your cloud. They have a domain, because, you know, and they, have all, they get to create all their users and their projects and so forth. And if you're a cloud provider, you're essentially going to give them the sheet and say, well, well here are the roles we, that we've created for you. Because, because they can't change the policy file. Only you can change the policy file. So this is it, guy, you know, Mr. Customer. This is my or girl. 20, 30, 40, 100, whatever roles I've created. Um, they may mean nothing to me as a customer. And, and, and to my users, my admins, you know, VM creates, I don't know what that is. Um, but I may want to map that onto a set of logical roles, alias roles, that mean something to my users. Maybe to my, you know, the name is my entity. You know, you know, teacher administrator or whatever it happens to be. So we want to provide a way where, you know, given the fact you may have a, a large set of fine-grained roles, you can place, basically use that same implied mechanism by creating an alias role which is private to your domain. Only you get to see it. Only you can assign it. And it doesn't show up in the token. And, most and it doesn't actually show up in the token. So because actually what we're doing is we're at token creation time, we're going to expand that out into the actual fine-grained roles the cloud providers uh, has created, which means I can give the power to my domain administrator to go do that modeling themselves. And, and it's not my job as a cloud provider to do it. I don't even understand their industry, probably. I can go do that. They can do that, and, but, but I don't have to change any policy files when the tokens get created. Basically, the actual, to actual roles that those aliases imply are the things that get put in the token. So yeah. Is a token really based? No. Domain well, specific roles, definitely not. The applied roles can. But they're not, it's not a huge amount that goes in. If you look at, compare this to like one entry in the service catalog, it's nothing. It's, it, there's not a lot that's in there. If you did really, really fine grained roles and you had them all expanded out, then they could get huge. And if we get there, we'll one. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I can't wait to have that problem. Yeah. And we'll find ways to optimize there, um, but we're not there yet. But, but the other point about it is that um, if you use, uh, one of the things that's come, into Keystone, certainly in the last release, um, and been hardened in Mataka is Fernet tokens. Fernet. Um, Fernet. Fernet. It is not Fernet. It, it no? is not Fernet, and you know what? It's based on a really vile, vile okay. tasting um, alcohol. So Fernet tokens are a new token <laughs> format. Came in, in, came in in the last release, um, and they're really a you know it's slightly off topic, but 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 relevant. In, in terms of the fact that you know, Keystone's been on, part of Keystone's journey has been on, well, what is the balance between having a token which basically tells me everything I need to know, for instance, perhaps, that, that I don't have to go to Keystone to validate it, or have nothing in the token, so I've always got to go to Keystone to validate it, or have it stored, prepared in a table in Keystone so I can read it out. We, we kind of been down that journey, and, and they've all got their pros and cons. The, mo the most modern version is the Fernet token, yes. um, which says, I'm going to put as much as I can in the token without blowing it up too big. And then actually, the set of roles don't go in the token. So if you have a complex set of roles, they don't actually go in the token. That when you validate the token, they'll get filled in for you. But it doesn't actually cause the token size yeah. to be blown up. Right. Tokens are a big size. Um, the other thing, um, just as we're talking about roles, is that... Um, Do you want to go forward? Uh, thank you. The, yeah. This thing's jumping on me, so I wasn't actually me advancing on you. I believe you. Um, it, as we're on this topic, is inherited role assignments. Uh, something that... Um, I chose the picture. That you did choose the picture. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate your, you, you know, honoring our great mm -hmm. role family. That's very kind of you. Well, they have inherited roles, right? <laughs> These two gentlemen here in front of you have inherited I got the, the joke. roles. I, got I couldn't the joke. think of a better way to illustrate it. I got it. <laughs> and we pay them a lot. I know, I know, I know, I know. I got it, I got it. Um, God save the queen. Uh, and these have to be the instance of Savannah. Um, uh, and they're, as I said, they're originally designed thinking about, okay, so if I'm going to create domains, 
you know, maybe inside a large enterprise, you know, various divisions, uh, or even a public cloud, if I'm, you know, there may be still some relationship between the, the cloud provider or the cloud admin and the projects within that domain. Maybe I've been given, um, maybe I need to ha have a role on each project to, I don't know, back it up or be able to get in there in an emergency, whatever it happens to be. Um, and whilst there are other forms you can do in terms of trust and so forth, one of the ideas was let's, let's let, a, let a, a, provide a facility where if you define or put a role on domain and mark is inherited, at runtime it'll get inherited to any project in that domain that exists now or created in the future. It was a kind of very relatively specific case. Now, of course, we have, um, since the last couple of releases, project hierarchies within domains in Keystone. So it's not a flat tenant, as it was called, model within a domain. You can actually have a hierarchy of projects within each domain. And so, of course, you can actually use inherited role assignments you know, assigned to any point in the tree, and you know, if, you know, the tree below that will get those inherited role assignments. So it's, it works exactly the same way. Um, um, uh, as it did before, um, using, using effectively the same API. Um, and you can actually also use that now to better model your role requirements within, um, within your, 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 um, your container real estate, your, your resource container real estate. Um, and just one word of caution here, slightly because of its heritage, if you, if you assign an inherited role at this point, it applies to all the roles below you, not that particular node. You can also assign a non-inherited role to that node if you actually wanted to be on the node itself. Just a word of warning when you try this. It might not do you what you expect. But it comes from that original idea of you're going to put it on the domain, it's going to go to the projects. And we did actually consider changing that, those semantics, but we thought actually the complexity of changing it and having some one way and some the other would be more complicated than leading as it is. So we left all of that. And as you're aware, in computer science, one of the hard problems is naming. Um, stop jumping ahead on me. Um, that's not me. The, um, the term inherited role assignment, if you're used to NIST RBAC, um, is what I talked about before with implied roles. And one of the reasons why it was called implied roles is because we had already sat on the name inherited roles. I like inherited here better because it's inherited down a tree, down a hierarchy. So it, I think this is the clearer use of it. But it does mean that we had to diverge from how things are discussed in literature elsewhere because um, because we're different, you know? And, uh, and we like to think that, I was gonna say like to think that we're better, but we know that we're not. Uh, but we are different. Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So, um, by the way, did you take out the slides on how we enforce is admin project? Yes, it's they, the last one. Okay, it's the last one, okay. So, um, if you're going through and you're trying to um, modify policy, as a lot of people have done here, um, I gave you a tool, well, we gave you a tool that I think you're gonna really like, which allows you to check what a policy would return without actually having to deploy it in anger, okay? So, in, in this is part of Oslo policy, the, um, the, 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 the library. You run it against a specific policy file. Um, the access-s access is like a JSON snapshot of what you would get from a token validation. The big thing we're looking in for in there is the roles. But if you look, there's examples of, of token validations, or just do a token validation and catch that from the API. You can see what it will give you. And you, uh, you run it against a, a file and say, A, I want to try this one specific rule. In this case, the example I have down there is I'm looking against identity list user. Or it can run it against all the rules in the file and say, pass, fail, pass, fail, pass, fail. And you can do a delta, keep a, keep a, a log up. This is what I had before I changed my policy file. This is what I had afterwards. I'm getting the same results. I haven't broken anything. Um, this should help you to move forward. And also, you can have different uh, token bodies, a token validation request, or auth data, whatever you want to call them. So you can say, OK, now that I'm doing this more fine-grained role, um, do I get a true here and a false here? So this should be a tool that helps you develop new policy to make use of the other tools that we did with the um, implied roles and domain-specific roles. And here's an example of what you would get. I didn't do the whole thing. I did a head five of if you, get, you did it against all the ones in um, the, the cloud sample that Henry talked about before. OK. Um, I don't know why I chose to put a picture of uh, Major General West, except that I'm kind of proud of the first um, female Army Surgeon General. Um, 
but there's, there's some tie in here that I'm sure I'll remember tomorrow. Token specific, okay, this, this gets back to that original problem. I originally had the slide at the beginning, Henry put it at the end, it's completely tricked me up, but it's good that we're landing on this one because this is that pain point. This is a case of one of those things that we can't change by default, but you can change in your deployments and make yourselves happier. Although we did find a way to figure out how to change it by default in the last one, I'll talk through that with you later. But, um, if you add these two configuration options, admin project domain name and admin project name, and by the way, that project better exist in that admin domain, um, you've now created this magic thing which is an admin project. And any tokens that you request that are scoped to that admin project will have an additional field on there, which is, you can see token.isAdminProject true. This means you can write new policy rules that separate out, say, I'm doing something for you know, adding a new hypervisor and differentiate that from I am doing project level administration. It also gives you a way to say, okay, either you have to have admin scope to this project or admin scope to the is admin project because you want to only get one token and do all your work everywhere because we've actually listened to you for once and said we're not going to make you rescope to each project. Okay? This is going to take time to change upstream. Um, we can't change the defaults without breaking everyone. As much as I really enjoy breaking everyone, they just don't let me do it anymore. Um, the Keystone Cloud sample does have this change in there. This is one of the places where we could do it. We put it right next to that thing that you would initially cut and paste, and so you don't have to cut and paste anymore. You change your config file, and now Keystone will um, behave according to this. Um, we tried doing it with the Keystone default policy file, um, and you can see the tests that are failing. I'll give you a sense of the problems that we get in there. Um, and we'll need to identify on the, the existing policy files the difference between a cloud admin operation and a project level admin. So there's been a lot of talk, the, the, um, the uh, UX effort here with uh, personas and all that that's going on elsewhere in OpenStack. We're not doing this all. We're not the only people playing in this. Um, there's a lot of future work to be done here. We need input. We need data. Um, we want to know how deployers want to manage the policy files. One of the things that we were told in the past when we tried to do um, policy as managed by Keystone was we have content management systems. We want to use those. We're not going to change that. We're not going to buck the system there. Um, but we still want to say, do we want to strive for a more collective view? What policy looks like across the board? Make sure that we are consistent, as we pointed out those differences between how Neutron and Nova view ownership and all that, and make sure we have a consistent way of talking about roles, at least through the, the things that used to be the core and as the tent gets bigger and bigger, to be able to talk about these things in a reasonable way for the as a services like you know Trove and all that, working on top of Nova and Neutron. And um, can they actually figure it out? You know, will cloud administrators, and to some extent domain administrators, be able to work out what a giver and user can do? Um, the, uh, this request came to me from the Horizon PTL. Um, about three years ago. They wanted to be able to figure out from a user's token, what should they show in the UI? Can we figure out for this user, what can they do? That's something I'm still working towards. There were so many stages we had to go through to be able to, to start addressing that question. So with that, um, I don't know if we've talked right through our answers, um, or our question and answers period. Um, I'm assuming we have, and bye. <laughs> Get out of it. A any questions? Yeah. Um. This looks a lot simpler than what was there before in some ways, but as a private cloud owner, operator, admin, it's really not that useful still. Okay. Um, what, do you, so what do you want? The problem I have is those are all managed on the individual control planes or nodes and all of that, and to see what's happening, it's very easy to, oh, on the Keystone policy, I made this one, and I forgot to change it on the Nova or on the Neutron, and all of a sudden you're managing all these files and they have to be deployed out, like yep. you said, to dozens or hundreds of nodes in order to be applied. So I, I ask this question every six months or so, and please forgive me, but when are we going to have something more like AWS IAM roles? <laughs> Where we can say, here's a user group, not a role, but this user is part of this group that can do these things in this project or this tenant instead of having to make system level changes or create a bajillion different roles so then those domain specific admins can then create ones that are inherited based on that instead of just like the domain admin says, this is what I want these users to be able to do. So and then as a step two, 
an instance being able to say, hey, find out more information or make these calls to other services. So, I mean, so obviously, you know, I mean, yes, we, you know. We're and not, I, I know we're is, not gonna do it. it. Ain't gonna happen. Nope, nope, <laughs> wouldn't be prudent. Um, so we obviously do have group assignments on, but I know this, is not, this is a, isn't actually a question, but just to make sure I understood, yeah. Yeah, you can have, you know, groups um, that you can assign role, you can assign those, uh, a role to a group on a project or a domain, but I think the point you're getting to is this idea of the fact that, you know, and Adam just alluded to it, the fact that right now the model is, Keystone is not the, well, Open Tech doesn't provide the this, this system for distributing those policy files around and manage them. It's just outside of the scope of any of the Open Tech tools. You, do, you, you might use Ansible or, or whatever you choose. And we have debated at length whether Keystone should take on a role there and, and be able to provide a collective view and so forth. Um, they didn't we like actually my got security enhanced OpenStack. We, 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 we it's got also quite you know, the same sort of thing of I, you mentioned look at a token to see what that user can do. Yep. I, as an admin, want to look at a user, not that user's token, and say, what can they do? And see what they can do. So yeah. I don't even have their token to know what their permissions yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. And so right now, in you know, Keystone, as I understand it, it's supposed to kind of somewhat manage. I mean, you the, know, the steps access, that you have to not, go to get to. OK, we don't even have an agreement from the services that we're going to collectively use the policy API in Keystone to manage the policy files. OK, the, mm -hmm. the policy API probably predates most people in this room's involvement with OpenStack, and it's still not used. Um, we're trying to get there. If we could get that far, then at least I could give you the steps to do that. So until what can I know which help get there? <laughs> until I know what policy file is go Well, we're having a lot of discussions. I actually came from, and I'm going to policy discussions across the street in the developer side of things, where we're, we're knocking down the pins one at a time or knocking whatever the walls, the you, you know, there's a, there's a lot of steps to get there. And remember, we have a lot of people that are using it now. I'm not allowed to break things as much as I'd like to do it. I really do, <laughs> you know? I, 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 I have to raise the, the, the in, in our R-A-Z-E, the existing, but we can't. So, so, um, so the, the advice I say is keep saying what you're saying because I, because I do understand where you're coming from. You know, keep telling, you know, no, you know, repeat this to the Nova guys and, yep. the, and the Cinder guys and the because in order to do that, we need a collective cross-project agreement of how those policy files uh, either distributed or could be accessed and so forth so that we can give those answers. So we can give, so something can give you that answer, which, because if it knows the policy files and keeps them rules, then we could give you the answer. That's what we have here on this, this slide, right? The, the, the questions, for you, that's exactly yeah. what we're trying to get yeah. to. Yeah. And yeah, there's, I know that there's people want things on individual resources. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so basically, oh, you you, man. Yeah. <laughs> I asked this question before yeah. in another session, and you told me, you know, this is the... Yeah, come to the session. The, yeah. So basically, so the question is, we do have this role-based API allow us to dynamically create a role. But yep. the role, if you want to give the permission, you have to go to another place, which is the policy file, yep. to give them the, the permission. And after yep. that, you have to restart the server basically means you don't have the capability to dynamically nope. assign a user. Nope. Well, so it, it, it's, it's not true you've got to tried. restart the server, actually. You don't have to restart the server, but, um, you don't have to restart the server, but, but yes, you're right. It, go review my, my talk from last, a year ago, the summit there, and you'll see dynamic policy. See, that's everything I wanted. It's, yeah. I mean, okay, and, and I agree. We don't have the ability to change it dynamically and have it effectively because those policy files, again, are distributed outside of the scope of Keystone and Kisson doesn't know where they are, and we need a, you know, again, I, I say to all of you, if, if this is what you, you really want as deployers, and, um, you know, keep telling not just Keystone, but, but some of the other projects, um, we can help carry your message, uh, and we will, it's just it comes a lot more weight if you say it than if I say it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm also being a little flippant here, but if you see that note, that second one there, we got feedback from the operators mm -hmm. that they did not want us rewriting the content management system. They wanted to, they had, whether it's Puppet or something Definitely. else, Ansible, in place, they did not want us replacing that okay. with a custom uh, operation or operator for this. So there, there's a lot of people with a lot of different views on this, and we have to keep um, the different viewpoints in, in mind there. Being able to put policy into Keystone that is then used to control access to Keystone is also problematic for other reasons, so. Um, uh, is, is someone waiting to set up for the next session? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, Adam, I'm gonna go and stand on this. Feel free to come and chat to us directly, um, and then we'll, we answer You're going questions. to, I have to sprint across the street. Okay, I'm gonna go to that corner and you can come and ask me questions directly. Yeah, you'll get better answers anyway. Thank you.